Have you ever done anything bad? I did something bad when I was young. Unforgivable. Hey everybody, welcome back to another episode of Engine Explained here on Burns Reviews. My name is John, and today we are talking about the new psychological horror thriller film, Resurrection, starring Rebecca Hall and Tim Roth. But before we begin, if you could, be sure to give the video a thumbs up and subscribe so that the YouTube algorithm doesn't return from your past and haunt you. Also, before we begin, just to let you know, there is a spoiler-free review right here. If you don't want any spoilers, there's going to be a ton of spoilers, obviously. And without any further ado, let's talk about it. Resurrection. Resurrection has world premiere at the Sundance Film Festival on January 22nd, 2022. Shortly after, IFC Films and Shudder acquired distribution rights to the film, releasing it in select theaters on July 29th, 2022, and then on video on demand August 5th. It is expected to make its way to Shudder in the fall as they have the rights to the film's first streaming window. The film is written and directed by Andrew Siemens who had previously directed the film called Nancy Please, which I haven't seen but also deals heavily with psychological trauma and the effects that happen after. A man is attempting to move in with his new girlfriend when he realizes that an important book that he needs is still in possession of his former roommate, Nancy, a toxic and manipulative character that, let's just say, doesn't give the book back willingly. In August of 2021, it was announced that Rebecca Hall and Tim Roth had both joined the cast. Hall had her breakthrough role in Christopher Nolan's 2006 thriller, The Prestige, starring Christian Bale and Hugh Jackman, and would later go on in such films such as Vicky Cristina Barcelona, Frost Nixon, The Town, Iron Man 3, The Gift, Godzilla vs. Kong, and most recently, The Night House. When writing the character of Margaret, Siemens channeled some inner fears that all parents have when they feel that they can't protect them from the world, saying, I got to thinking about fears around parenthood, specifically the fear that your child or children are vulnerable and you will be unable to keep them safe, the fear that you will fail in your fundamental duty as a parent and allow your child to be hurt or victimized. This line of thinking brought to mind the subgenre of parental vigilante films. These movies play on these fears, but also provide a sort of grandiose wish fulfillment fantasy about being able to protect your child in even the most extreme circumstances, and becoming sort of an unstoppable superhero in the process, out of sense of fierce love and dedication towards your kid. While many will know Tim Roth from Tarantino films such as Pulp Fiction, Reservoir Dogs, and The Hateful Eight. More recently, Roth can be seen reprising his role of Abomination in Shang-Chi and She-Hulk, Attorney at Law. What we wanted to do with his character was a bit of a risk, Seaman says, but it also felt more truthful. Tim didn't want to play David as simply some mustache trolling villain. He didn't want to exude overt menace or malevolence. He wanted to play him as a normal guy, someone who seems utterly harmless to anyone who is not Margaret. I like that choice because people who are immoral or sadistic rarely behave in such a way that telegraph their malign intent. They try to disguise that and often seem totally innocuous. Part of Tim's approach was to play the character as though he perceives himself as kind of a romantic hero, someone who was nobly trying to recreate a deep and special love that was tragically interrupted many years earlier. David thinks he's doing the right thing. Tim also embraced the idea of David understanding himself as the victim and being wounded and aggravated, like, how dare you do this to me when I'm trying to help you? The cast was then expanded with Grace Kaufman as Maggie's concerned daughter, Abby, Michael Esper, who plays the co-worker slash friend with benefits, and Angela Rong Carbone as Gwen, an employee who works for Margaret and seeks guidance from, yet also lacks any sense of empathy when she shares her plight. God, I hate this scene. Not the actress, mind you. She did a great job giving this character life. I just hate how well done the scene is put together, honestly. Margaret is giving you a phenomenal seven minute dialogue, giving you everything she has. You know, she's basically like, I think I need a hug. And you're just like, well damn Jackie, I can't control the weather. <laughs> hate it. <laughs> I love how good it's done, but it makes me so angry. Filming took place in the summer of 2021 in Albany, New York. Hall recalled that it was a rather short shoot, restricted by a tight budget. To prepare, Hall worked out vigorously, as she wanted to portray Margaret as a character that was incredibly driven and detail-orientated. She learned all of her lines incredibly well, knowing that reshoots and multiple takes would not always be an option in comparison to big-budget films. Most impressively, much like Jack Nicholson in A Few Good Men, delivered on set a seven-minute dialogue in a single take. More than that, it was the first take. 
surprising both cast and crew members who found themselves ahead of schedule for the rest of the day. Tomorrow, tomorrow is the monologue. You know, there was a lot of that going on on set. Like everyone was like, are we ready for the monologue? Okay, everyone, just, just like calm down about the monologue. I've never told anyone that in my whole life. You should be honored. Ending explained. It's gonna be a happy ending for you. In the story, Margaret is a single mother living in New York with her teenage daughter, Abby. Everything seems to be okay until she notices David, a mysterious older man from Margaret's past who begins appearing randomly in her day-to-day -day life. She becomes convinced that he means her and her daughter harm, so Margaret embarks on a vigilante mission to protect her daughter and take down David once and for all. And granted, at first, you really don't know what to make of David. Is he real or just in Maggie's head? Around the second act of the film, we realize that David is in fact real and back to control Maggie the way he did 20 years ago. Later, around the middle of the film, we learn that Maggie, when she was 19, fell in love with David, who was a much older man and little by little was sucked into his many manipulations. She was asked to perform what he often called a kindness, which started simple such as cooking and cleaning and grew into being more sadistic and cruel in nature, such as walking around with no shoes and hurting herself with cigarettes to prove her love for him. Yeah, he's essentially Ezra Miller. Allegedly. I'm, I'm really mad that they canceled the, the Batgirl movie and the Batman movie and all that. But hey, we're getting a Joker movie in two plus years. <laughs> when Margaret became pregnant, David became threatened that the attention will be taken away from him so he kills the child. Presumably with a knife, as Maggie recalls that all that was left of her child was two infant fingers. When asked what happened to their child Ben, David responds by saying that he is in his stomach, living there alive and well. Get in my belly! I shouldn't joke, but it's a bit absurd. Margaret runs away from David, but 20 years later, David finds her in America and claims that Ben is still alive in his belly, alive and well, using this bit of fiction, gaslighting her back into David's life. Sadly, Margaret somewhat believes David's lie, as she is overcome with guilt by what happened all those years ago. Despite being David's victim, she holds herself responsible for what happened, as she feels she should have left before David had a chance to cause any harm. Throughout the film, we see Margaret begin to unravel. Her daughter is leaving her soon, and she feels that she has become obsolete. By the end of the third act, she agrees to meet David in a hotel room so that she can talk to her alleged son, Ben. However, things take a violent turn when Margaret kills David by stabbing him in the stomach and removing a very much alive infant from his abdomen. Yeah, that happens. The next shot we see is most definitely a fantasy in which Margaret is having a civilized conversation with her daughter and holding an infant that is implied to be Ben, considering the child has eight fingers. Okay, let's break this down. At the end of the day, Resurrection is a heartbreaking character study that focuses on the long-term effects of trauma and how it haunts you long after it happens. Margaret's past is devastating and something that she has never addressed in the 20 years since it's happened. She ran away, she tried to fill her grief by having another child, and she's remained emotionally distant from having a real relationship with anyone out of fear of what might happen. Sleeping with her married co-worker for sexual gratification, but keeping most people at bay. Answering some of the harder questions, do I think David actually shows up in the present day? Maybe. Did she really kill David? Unclear. My initial take after David drops the act of being someone else is that he was in fact there, manipulating her, but my opinion changed as the movie went on. In the film's final moments, we see Margaret has completely devolved into a fantasy world where everything is a little too perfect. She has her baby Ben, her daughter is happy and treating her with respect, and just in general, everything looks a lot brighter and cleaner in comparison to the rest of the movie. I think in those final moments when Margaret goes from joy to absolute dread, it's her realizing that she is in a surreal fantasy. And if she is in a fantasy, which is dreadful enough, she's also thinking, what if David is still out there? It's only until the end of the film that we realize that Margaret has been moving further and further away from reality. It starts with something small, like finding a gray hair on her desk, and ends violently with a murder. Knowing what we know from the last few moments, I think it's fair to say that Margaret has been descending into madness ever since it became clear that her daughter would be leaving her. As stated earlier, it was the one thing giving her focus and purpose after what happened after all those years. Was David really there in the present? I don't think it really matters. The damage that was already done 20 years ago and David has been living in her head rent free ever since. 
Of course, him showing up later on would certainly exasperate her mental state much quicker, but a case could be made that he never returned at all. Keep in mind, there's literally no evidence that indicates that he's actually there. The landlady in the building doesn't know who he is. He doesn't talk to anyone. When he's in the restaurant, there's no waitress taking his order or asking if he needs anything. Even when he shows up at her office building, it's carefully shot in such a way that you can play it out either way. Legit, he is like Bruce Willis in The Sixth Sense. When asked about the ending, Seaman said, Yes, there are ambiguities in the movie, especially with regards to the ending, quite intentionally. It's very tricky to work in that space because you can obviously tiptoe far one way or the other, or it can be very unsatisfying if it doesn't play effectively. The trick is to make it engaging and engrossing dramatically and create a coherent emotional payoff, so that any ambiguity or mystery feels earned and warrants the audience's attention and consideration. There's no correct interpretation of the ending of Resurrection. It isn't a riddle to be solved. The ending is, on its face, a happy one. But its instability and impossibility suggest that the truth may be something far more tragic than what's depicted on the screen. Because our point of view never leaves Margaret, we never really know where the truth begins and her delusion ends. We know that she's seeking catharsis from what happened all those years ago. This is made very apparent when she is hugging David in the final act. What we don't know is if any of this is actually happening. Here's a theory about what I suspect happened based on all the context clues that we were given. And it's pretty dark and twisted, so stay with me. I think her past events of what happened 20 years ago did in fact happen. I think maybe she saw someone that looked like David that maybe triggered some memories that were partially suppressed. I think her daughter potentially leaving is most certainly the catalyst that set all this off, and I suspect is the driving force behind what's happening. The threat of her leaving has sent her into a spiral in which she can no longer distinguish between fantasy and reality. As far as the third act, I think it's entirely possible that she has lost the reality button and could have even killed a man that she thought was David. That or the hotel scene was entirely inside of her head, and she was trying to work out some unresolved trauma. You know, like a mind palace. And here's the dark part. What if David never came back at all, and if after losing Abby she felt the only option was to have another child? We see her sleep with Peter several times, even demanding a quick bath and quickie. I think she's trying to get pregnant to fill the void that she knows Abby will soon leave. After the hotel scene, there is no indication on how much time has passed, but it's entirely possible that it is in fact Peter's baby. And even sadder, it's possible that she perceives that child to be her child Ben from 20 years ago, even going as far as cutting off two of the child's fingers to fulfill the sick fantasy that she is clearly playing out. Of course, she doesn't see the horrors of any of this, she just sees what she wants to. There is a part of me that wanted the last shot of the film to snap back to reality to show what was really happening. You know, maybe she's like in that crappy apartment and she's, you know, arguing with her daughter and she's holding a baby and the, the baby maybe has like a band-aid around his hand. I watch a lot of sick horror movies, way more demented than that. So when you have a movie that presents a baby in an oven in a dream sequence, I'm like, okay, so we're in that territory. And my mind goes, yeah, I think my theory could hold water. It it does carry a little bit of weight when you look at all the clues in the movie. That kind of tracks. I think you're having an episode. I think most people watching the film won't go with such a dark interpretation. I think many will probably think, yeah, she may or may not have killed somebody. And when we're seeing this scene, she's probably in reality sitting in a padded cell completely detached from reality. But that's just my take. Don't come at me in the comments. I'd love to hear your comments, I'd love to hear your theories, but don't be a jerk. If I see a comment that's just like, an angry troll of a person, eh, I, I shouldn't have to say it, but I mean, I don't know, people suck. But well, that's just my take. I find that this is a film that's pretty interesting and that you can watch it multiple times with different viewfinders and it still works. At the end of it all, it's not really what's happening in front of you but rather about all that has already happened and how those events have affected Margaret in the long run. I, I found it to be very pleasant because there was a small part of me that thought this was going to be The Night House Part 2. It felt like the same setup. You watch the trailer and you're like, all right, we have this woman in distress. She's dealing with trauma. It's brought on by her ex. And now we don't know if it's reality or not. And I love the scene where we get to where he just drops the act. In the trailer, he's just like, oh, I think he got me confused with someone else. They're British. And 
he just drops it and he's like yeah I'm, I'm him and I love that but then again that doesn't necessarily mean that he's real he could just be you know a, a, a personality in her mind or, or some type of psych you know psychological break it's completely open to interpretation as the director Andrew Seaman said but please comment down below let me know what you thought be sure to give the video a thumbs up we do have another ending explained right here if you want to watch that and uh, until next time guys I've been John here on Burns Views. You just got burned, and we will see you next time. A sadist never understands why others aren't enjoying his sadism as much as he is. You should find someone who makes you feel good.